Um, good afternoon. I am uh, rarely speechless, but I am in a state of a shock seeing that we have this many people coming in person to hear about electronic health records on such a hot day, and people are still coming, so I, I was trying to give people more time to come in. Welcome. It's 1 o'clock, and this is a session, as I said, on electronic health records, CDC Public Health Grand Rounds. Uh, just to remind people that we have now been doing this almost for two years, and these are the web pages where you can watch us internally and externally live. To give you a sense of the two upcoming topics in August and September, and remind you that we will be moving to the third Tuesday in a month, same time, starting in September. Uh, I do want to share with you the latest about our viewership, which is a huge source of pride for those of us who work on this every month. Uh, we average over 13 to 14,000 people viewing us live, and then additional numbers, as you can see in red, watching the archived uh, events. And we do have a few of the events that have gone over 20,000 or over 15,000. So this could be a um, record breaker. Uh, we uh, are aligning our science clips, and this month, again, we have topic on informatics and electronic health records in our weekly science clips. Now, for a lot of people, not necessarily for this audience, because I actually recognize my audience, and this is a little bit different, um, not going to say nerdier, but <laughs> a little bit different audience. Um, IT and electronics are usually an issue, and a lot of people feel about it this way. But certainly, this is a topic that has surpassed everybody's expectations. And I think you are expecting to hear from the geek squad today. Well, I will have to disappoint you in that sense. The question that the geek squad would say is, we would explain what we do, but it could melt your brain. Um, I do have an example of that, however, and this is the only geeky thing about this group of people. And here is an email from one of our speakers to me two days ago saying, I redacted some of our correspondence, but <laughs> it says, always amazing that a bunch of people who say they're all about communication can't explain themselves. And this was the answer to my question, what are health electronic health records, can you put it in plain language? And we had a little bit of a challenge there. But the, the speakers we have gathered today are absolutely unbelievable. Here are their topics. You will, you will see about the transformative changes for public health. You will see here about the view from the trenches and real life. And you will hear about implementation of health information exchanges at different levels, at the state level as well. And then we have the head of all of these activities, Farzad Mostashari, who is here with us, and, and really delighted to, to uh, have all these speakers here. Now, um, here is a photo of Farzad when he was a small child, and you can see that he was already geared in this direction. So you may think that these people, you know, just doing the IT and all of this would have a certain sense of style, and but they're actually First, Harry Potter lovers, which I found out only during lunchtime, so I have nothing funny to say about that. But I want, also wanted to bring to your attention how spectacularly good looking they are. And you know how looks are important to me, and I point out when we have a good group of people. So here it is Robert versus Edward Norton, Seth versus Steve Martin, and I think this is the winner among, in men. Farzad. <laughs> Wait till you see the ladies. So here is Amy. <laughs> and Jack. So not only are they smart and good looking, they're really super people. And I am sure you will enjoy hearing from them as much as I have enjoyed working with them. And before you hear from them, Dr. Frieden is going to say a few words.
Great. I don't want to take time away from a terrific set of presentations. So let me just uh, highlight that there is an enormous promise of electronic health records. But as we know, there are many things in IT that don't live up to their promises. Our challenge in public health is to embrace these changes, adapt with them, and figure out how we in public health can help promote and interact with the changing world of electronic health records and medical information that's available to providers, systems, and patients online. Uh, electronic health records are expanding very rapidly. The meaningful use criteria have tremendous potential to increase the quality and impact of care. Systems like uh, uh, clinical decision support, patient registries, reminder systems have the potential to transform the quality of healthcare in this country and also to bridge the gap between clinical medicine and public health. What they will also do is change the interface between healthcare and public health. And meaningful use phase one is focused on electronic laboratory reporting, immunization registries, and, immuniz and uh, syndromic surveillance. And in phase two, uh, we have the potential to do even more to bind healthcare and public health closely together. It's an enormous opportunity, but we also have enormous challenges. Uh, challenges fiscally, challenges in personnel, challenges in legacy systems, challenges in the lack of funding for public health information transformation. But we have to figure out smart, savvy, effective ways to bridge that gap and embrace the new world of electronic health records and the interactions that it will have with the public health system at all levels. So I want to thank uh, the speakers very much for this session. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Seth Foldy. And uh, as uh, Tanya has given us an object lesson, what all the geeks have always told you, be careful what you put in an email, because you'll end up seeing it on YouTube, which uh, this will, uh, which will be, and mine will be there uh, later this afternoon. Um, I'd, uh, obviously, my uh, staff in FITPO and my colleagues in public health informatics across the country know that that remark about communicating couldn't possibly have been about them. Uh, I'm going to describe very briefly why electronic health record adoption is growing so fast, how the use of those record systems is changing, and why this is a transformational development for public health. Uh, what is an electronic health record? It's a systematic collection of a patient's health information, but it's more than an electronic folder full of electronic notes. This information is formatted digitally, so it can be usable by information systems to do things like track care with statistics or graphs, to issue warnings and reminders, and to facilitate communication. For example, in the process of creating a legible and convenient electronic prescription, the electronic health record system simultaneously updates the medication list, which then alerts the doctor to a possible medication interaction before she even has a chance to say goodbye to the patient. When information is standardized and can be used by machines in this way, these are some of the results that can occur. Health Information Exchange, or HIE, is used to securely transmit this kind of information electronically between organizations, for example, for e-prescribing or for public health reporting. This requires technical standards and networks, but it, even more importantly, it requires agreements about how information may and may not be used and how privacy will be maintained. Jack Davies and Amy Zimmerman will share their approaches to HIE from opposite ends of the country later in these rounds. Now, in 2010, fewer than a quarter of healthcare providers used even a basic electronic record. But many hospitals and office-based uh, professionals at that time said they intend to adopt and use comprehensive electronic health records as early as 2013. What's driving this change? The Health IT for Economic and Clinical Care Act uh, was, uh, part, uh, was part of the 2009 American Recovery and Renewal Act. 
It created high stakes financial incentives for acute care hospitals and most health care providers. And to get those incentives, they have to adopt EHRs that are certified to federal standards. They have to exchange information with public health and other partner systems. They have to actually achieve patient care and population health objectives using these new tools, what is called meaningful use of electronic health records. And you'll notice how this impacts office practice when we hear from Dr. Lamberts. Now the incentives already began this year. The objectives escalate over time, and the incentives are maximized if providers get on board early. Uh, so the impetus is fairly strong. The Office of the National Coordinator for HIT, who you will hear from later, was funded to adopt necessary information standards, to provide technical assistance to providers, to solve technical challenges, and to address workforce needs. Unfortunately, Congress did not fund public health agencies to adapt their systems to these big changes, but CDC and other organizations are using existing resources to help. The High Tech Meaningful Use Program seeks to meet five major goals, and each of these goals have very specific objectives that hospitals and providers must meet. To address quality and safety, certified EHRs in the program have to be able to automatically generate quality measures. This enables payers to more easily do standardized pay for performance for their, for their providers. The certified EHR also then helps providers meet these uh, uh, targets uh, using quality and safety alerts and reminders, and also patient registries or directories of patients who may share a given diagnosis. To further enhance population and public health, in the first stage of the meaningful use uh, 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 program, electronic health records must also be able to communicate laboratory, laboratory, laboratory results for reportable conditions to public health agencies, report immunizations to immunization registries, and to perform syndromic reporting to public health authorities. Other meaningful use goals are to improve the coordination of care, to evolve patients in their care, and to protect privacy and security. Widespread electronic health record use for these objectives can have major preventive impact. The public health reporting objectives will help improve the completeness and the speed with which public health receives surveillance information. And it also makes a richer set of data potentially available about trends in both health care and the health of populations. Standardized electronic data, receiving it in this way, helps public health programs keep pace with this faster, more complete, ever-increasing uh, information load. It can reduce the need for data entry. It facilitates the reuse of information and analysis of that information. Meanwhile, in the clinical setting, EHR tools like decision support help providers reduce the risks of cardiovascular disease healthcare-acquired infections, and other public health winnable battles. When you combine the potential of clinical decision support with real-time communication with public health, we see our way towards a possible future where near real-time public health alerts are delivered to providers in the context of caring for a particular patient when it's relevant. So these opportunities also bring real challenges for public health, as you'll hear more about from Dr. Mostashari, our, our national coordinator. The cartoon reads, we have lots of information technology, we just don't have any information. Public health agencies are going to need to update their information systems, to use them creatively, and to work collaboratively if they're going to be able to receive and use the information coming from tomorrow's healthcare system. And if we don't do so, uh, we may be left behind in this fast-changing environment. Thank you very much. And now I'm pleased to, uh, to introduce Dr. Robert Lamberts. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Robert Lamberts. I am from Evans Medical Group, which is in Evans, Georgia, two hours east of here, uh, just outside of Augusta. Now, you may all be asking yourself the same question I asked myself when CD said, C asked me to do these grand rounds. Why me? What do I have that is of, valuable, of value to all of you? Well, 
First off, I am a doctor in real life. <laughs> I am a practicing primary care physician. I do spend most of my time in the office. I'm not only that, but I'm part of the dying breed of, uh, or supposedly dying breed, of doctors who are self-employed. But there's more. I do have geek credentials. I'm not only a doctor, I am a board-certified geek. Our practice installed electronic health records in 1996, which was quite a bit before most other practices did. Uh, but 1996 had its drawbacks. It meant very slow computers. It meant poor uh, information support. It, it meant that we didn't have any interfaces. And, and most of all, it meant that we dealt with real immature EHR products. And the products were designed by engineers and really didn't flow in the exam room. Um, but I had to make it work because our survival as a business depended on it. I had to pay my staff, I had to pay my rent, regardless uh, of what the EHR did. So I became obsessed with clinical workflow in the office setting. Um, I wanted the best patient experience, the best quality, and to maintain uh, a good lifestyle. Well, all of that had a surprising outcome. I became a leader in electronic health records among doctors. So. Why not stay with paper charts? Well, I have a three-word answer for that. Attention deficit disorder. <laughs> I found it impossible to keep track of hundreds, thousands of patients getting information from hundreds of different sources in the paper charts, especially when most of the information I get from the outside world, the useful information, is surrounded by a whole bunch of information that's not useless, which I call fluff. Um, I still could have managed with paper, but that meant seeing about four patients a day, uh, getting home late, and trying to get the day longer than 24 hours. The good news is, is that we not only survived, that we thrived. Our attention to clinical workflow allowed us to have very high quality and good income without sacrificing our personal lives. And this culminated in 2003 when we won the HIMSS Award, uh, the Davies Award from HIMSS, which uh, awarded us for use of an EHR in a clinical setting. Now, this, there wasn't a cash advantage or a new car along with this, unfortunately, but it did validate uh, my zeal for electronic health records, and it gave me a great big soapbox on which to evangelize for them among the doctors and others. This evangelism actually got quite a bit easier uh, when the meaningful use criteria came up in, uh, just this past year. Um, the, this rewards clinicians using electronic health, word, uh, health records in a meaningful way uh, up to $40,000 over three years. It's quite, a, quite an incentive. Now, the word meaningful, as I quote, is, of course, defined by the government, which means that even for our practice, this was not all that easy. Um, however, I've been assured that we have passed and that our check is in the mail. So the real reason I'm here is because I am real life. I'm not theoretical. Academic theory and public policy crash land in my exam rooms. If, academic, if those theories work, then my life and my patients' lives get better. If they don't work, we all can be hurt. I'm also the best case scenario for all of this. The data exchange needs to happen. We want to interface. We, our practice really wants to interface with public health. Uh, and we will do whatever we need to to get that working. It's to our advantage, to our patients' advantage. So if it doesn't work for us, I don't think it's going to work for anyone. So what's so great about EHR? Well, first off, information is far more organized and easier to find. Communication is easier. Um, I email lab results to my patients, send consults and prescriptions electronically as well, and I do it. My nurses, my staff don't do those things. I do those in the exam room while I'm with the patient. Um, I have reminders based on accurate medical, uh, accurate information to, for care, and it's definitely less likely that I'll duplicate care. Uh, 
Most importantly, with a connected electronic health record, I don't work in the dark. Um, I can know when my patients have been to the hospital, when they've been to a specialist, when they had their medications changed and such. All of this, conceivably, uh, will save money, and it, it should save lots of it. So what of the record itself? Well, um, I know what has happened with my patients. I can document it quickly, uh, and I can create a care plan very easily uh, with good information. But there is a big downside to the information, uh, downside here, and that is too much information. Our system rewards using lots of words, and the end result is lots of words. Um, and those words are, don't necessarily help care. In fact, a lot of times they stand in the way of it. It's actually an ugly thing. Despite this fact, we have uh, used EHR to greatly improve quality. Our practices calls in infants who have immunizations due who don't have appointment schedule. We have, uh, we call in diabetics, the elderly, people with hypertension who are due for visits and don't have appointments scheduled. We use secure messaging to email lab results to patients, saving stamps, staff time, and getting information to the patients much quicker. We access immunization registry online getting up-to-date information regardless of where the vaccines were given, and my nurses very, very much like this. Our quality numbers are not only above the national average, they far exceed the national average. Uh, our patients are happy, I'm not losing any staff over this, and we haven't had to sacrifice income and quality of life. But the road ahead is hard for everybody, especially for other doctors. Part of the problem with this is that the acceptance among physicians is not high. They haven't accepted it because they think it makes more work for them. Data ownership is a real big issue. Who owns the data? Is it the patient? Is it the hospital? Is it the doctor? Or a mix of those. HIPAA and scary stories about patient data being stolen scare doctors and hospitals from sharing their data. And uh, electronic records potentially make it easier for malpractice attorneys to go through the chart. And doctors are very well aware of this, uh, maybe just a little paranoid about this. Obviously, I'll give you a little time to look at that. Okay. Obviously, I believe uh, life is better with an electronic health record. But as you have guessed it, I am not normal. As more patient, I am far more patient with the downside of electronic medical records than most physicians, and I still struggle with shortcomings, so others will struggle more. And the biggest shortcoming, in my view, are incentives. There, are not enough, there is not enough upside to justify the downside for most physicians. So what kind of incentives would doctors need? Well, first off, give physicians information to make better care decisions and make it easier to do while keeping it secure. Second, make sure that electronic health records work in the real doctor's office, work in the exam room, not just work for engineers, for uh, data gatherers, or payers. Third, pay for better care and better documentation and not for more words. And fourth, educate the public. Show how good care can be with a connected electronic health record and they will demand better care using electronic health records. I believe that good use of information technology along with reform of our health care payment system will benefit patients, doctors, the public health community, and the public at large. And who knows, maybe I'll even get home at a reasonable hour. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Jack Davies. Thank you. And hello, I'm Jack Davies, and I'm going to give you the perspective of an organization that runs healthcare facilities, has implemented a lot of electronic health records systems, and also operates a regional health information exchange. First, let me tell you a little bit about us. Inland Northwest Health Services, INHS, is a not-for-profit company that we provide a wide variety of shared services, including information technology services. 
We've connected 34 hospitals on a common information system and provide electronic health records to more than 750 physicians and providers and over 100 clinics. Most of the organizations that receive these services are independent of each other and of us. We're, we're a regional and community collaboration, not an integrated delivery system. I'm going to share with you a little bit of our experiences, what we've learned, and provide examples of how the public health system in our region has benefited from it. INHS has extensive experience implementing electronic health records. We began in 2003 providing services in eastern Washington and northern Idaho. Uh, and in part because of these, more, these efforts, more than 60% of the, the providers, the physicians in this region, have electronic health records well above the national average. We're now supporting physician offices in four states. Let me tell you just a few of the things we've learned there. There are a number of issues with an EHR, starting with the type of the system implemented, how it's implemented, and how it gets used. Early EHRs, as you've heard, were essentially electronic file cabinets. Oops, one more click too often. Uh, were essentially electronic file cabinets. Uh, they stored information well, but they weren't useful for decision making, for patient support, or population health care within the practice, let alone for public health. This is changing in part because of the meaningful use regulations. But public health organizations should recognize that EHRs may not be sophisticated enough to support population health needs. In addition, every practice wants to customize their EHRs. Uh, and they invariably, clinicians within the practice don't like the way something works, and they decide to change it and, and enter information a little bit differently. And all of these issues affect data usability. EHRs are focused within a practice or a group. Health information exchange is what's necessary to share information between organizations or between providers. HIE is the electronic transmission of information from healthcare related data from organizations that are, is done according to national standards. Information exchange has occurred for many years based on point to point connections. Increasingly though, there's centralized systems being established to make HIE easier. In part, this is because of health reform and the changing healthcare environment that's creating a business case for HIE. The HIE environment is very complex and is likely to remain that way for some time. Some HIEs are enterprise based and they allow health care organizations to share information for, uh, to support business operations and business needs. Some, such as ours, has developed at a community level, uh, including uh, allowing information sharing between unrelated multiple organizations that have data sharing focused on immediate clinical care. More recently, HIEs are being established at a state level, and Amy's going to be talking about that in a moment, supported in part by high-tech funding. The types of services and general availability of data vary from a focus on clinical data to an emphasis on administrative transactions such as eligibility. Similarly, the types of data available vary widely. Most HIEs were started by connecting large data sources such as hospitals and laboratories. However, as HIEs mature, there is an increasing availability of data from ambulatory care settings. Regardless of the structure, there really has been a huge growth in health information exchanges over time. A recent survey found that the number of operational HIEs has tripled from only nine states that had two or more operational HIE initiatives in 2005 to 33 states that have a total of 78 operational HIEs in 2010. Like many other HIEs, our company, INHS, started by connecting up hospitals and laboratories and sharing that information out to physicians and other providers. It's grown now from six hospitals and one physician and, and one regional reference laboratory to cover 34 hospitals and three reference laboratories, including two national labs such as Quest. I've got a couple of examples of how we've used this common source of information to benefit public health. Over the past two years, the INHS HIE has been providing de-identified emergency department data and inpatient data to the Washington State Department of Health and also here to the CDC. This includes demographics, diagnoses, procedures, lab results, and vital signs. The data was relatively easy for the public health organizations to access because it came from one organization rather than having them to go to different separate hospitals. This data proved especially valuable during the H1N1 influenza outbreak. And we're now using the same method to transmit identifiable reports, mandatory disease reports, to the public health agencies. We send the data daily, INHS does, to the State Department of Health, and they aggregate it and send summary reports onto the CDC. 
The State Department of Health also has a system in place to make the data available electronically to the appropriate local health agencies, sending it out based on the county of residence for the patients. Here's just an example of how, how this affected it. In, uh, this map shows the geographic coverage for hospital reporting in Washington State and the surrounding region in 2009, starting before we made the link to the INHS HIE. And if you note that the per capita rate of hospital resorts, reports received for each county has the highest part in western Washington there around Puget Sound, where the originally participating hospitals were located. After connecting to the INHS HIE, the State Department of Health collected significantly more reports from the rest of the state and from outlying areas as well. In addition, inpatient data from this HIE has supported other types of public health interventions. One of the things DOH noticed was that flu vaccination rates were very low for pregnant women. Uh, at the time of their delivery. And based on that, the state health officer was able to send a letter out to clinicians across the state during the flu season, asking them to emphasize vaccination for pregnant and postpartum women. In summary, both EHR and HIE provide unprecedented public health access, access for public health organizations to rich sources of population health data. Growth in these technologies has accelerated dramatically in recent years, but that's not a guarantee that the data is going to be readily available to public health agencies. Public health organizations really need to be at the table in their communities and at their states to take advantage of the changes that are going on right now. There are tremendous pressures on healthcare organizations and providers to transform the entire healthcare delivery system. Rather than insisting that healthcare organizations meet specific public health needs, public health officials should work to understand what's going on right now, how are those changes affecting healthcare. Taking advantage of these changes and meeting healthcare providers halfway is going to benefit both public health and the healthcare providers in the long run. Thank you, and our next speaker is Amy Zimmerman. Good afternoon, I'm Amy Zimmerman, and I'm, while I'm not gonna sing or dance like Cher, I do wanna share with you from a state health department perspective how the transformation to electronic health records will impact public health and the opportunities that it presents. As Rhode, Island's health, uh, as Rhode Island State Health Information Technology Coordinator, I hope to share some insight into the potential public health goals related to health information exchange and uh, electronic health records, the role that the health departments can play in driving the adoption of health information technology, Rhode Island's experience with implementing some health information technology, and both the challenges and opportunities for public health. So like Dr. Lamberts uh, mentioned, I too am often asked why adopt in public health and why have providers adopt electronic health records? And in addition to the response of providing better, safer patient care, I would posit that implementing electronic health records will promote data-driven decision-making for healthcare policy and transform the practice of medicine. Providers will now have the tools and the data accessible to become ambassadors of public health. They will be able to manage their patient population as a whole in addition to providing individual care. And this is very critical for public health's focus on prevention. If we hope to achieve these goals, like provider offices and large healthcare facilities, departments of health also need to have the human and technical capacity and infrastructure to leverage electronic health records. This is both challenging and can be an opportunity. Public health agencies play an important role in driving, electronic, uh, in driving the electronic transformation that is now underway. And I want to highlight just a few of the less obvious roles. Not all public health departments will be able to assume all of these rules or facilitate them. While health departments can often serve as facilitators, they also have regulatory responsibilities that can be used as levers. For example, certificate of need programs, compliance orders, these can require the adoption of electronic health records or um, involvement in health information exchanges as appropriate. Uh, health departments can also define standards of care. Boards of medical licensures can either require or promote the use of electronic health records and working with health information exchanges. And they can also educate providers about the, pit, the potential pitfalls of not using the technology properly. Health departments can also help to align clinical quality measures so that comparable data can be aggregated and analyzed. Now I'd like to share a little bit of the work that's underway in Rhode Island. Assuming that measuring progress is critical to achieving success, in Rhode Island, the Department of Health uses its public reporting law 
to require all licensed physicians to complete an annual health information technology survey. If they do not respond, they're automatically listed as not having an electronic health record, and that is on a public website. As you can see, there's been gradual but steady increase in the adoption rates. And based on this year's survey, about 51% of the providers in Rhode Island have adopted an electronic health record, although this is assumed to be an underestimate because the response rate was, the response rate was 63%, meaning 37% then were listed whether they had an electronic record or not as not having one. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about electronic prescribing efforts that have gone on in Rhode Island. Electronic prescribing refers to the electronic transmission of a prescription from between a prescriber and a dispenser, and the prescriber uses either an electronic health record module or can use some standalone software. SureScripts is the company that operates the largest nation's health uh, e-prescribing network, and it's initially it was initially beta tested in Rhode Island. Rhode Island has been able to um, consistently be ranked as one of the top three states for electronic prescribing, and I'm proud to say was the first state in the nation to have 100% of pharmacies capable of receiving electronic prescriptions. We also have a statewide electronic prescribing committee that monitors the um, metrics using some of the SureScripts data. So, for example, the data indicates here, as you can see, that while 78% of all prescribers are electronically prescribing, only 36% of the um, prescriptions are going through electronically. This type of data really helps inform the work of the committee to try to identify barriers and come up with some solutions. This next slide shows, this graph shows the percent of e-prescribers that are using an electronic health record, which is the um, dark blue line, versus those that are using standalone software, the lighter blue line. And as you can see, the trend uh, really changes as the implementation of high-tech and meaningful use come into effect. You can see that the use of standalone tools are going down and those that are e-prescribing from electronic health records are increasing, which is what we would want. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Rhode Island's health information exchange efforts. And in Rhode Island, this started back actually in the 1990s when the Department of Health created KidsNet, which is a computerized child health information system, and it includes our immunization registry. KidsNet integrates preventive health information from nine different public health programs, and it's used by providers to identify patients needing preventive services. They can go on through a web portal and actually look up individual information by patient. KidsNet data is also used for coordination of care, for quality assurance activities, and to inform policy decisions. And as you can see here, this is just one example of the use of the data in the pie chart where by integrating the data, it became evident that 12% of children in Rhode Island over a 10-year period have had three different primary care providers. So that helps inform some of the policy decisions and need to coordinate care. In 2000 and... Um, Four, at the request of the community, the Department of Health applied for and received the Agency for Health uh, Research and Quality funding to begin to develop a statewide health information exchange called Current Care. This was developed as a public-private partnership with transparent community governance structure and a lot of consumer engagement. And that resulted in um, legislation uh, requiring an opt-in consent model for the statewide health information exchange. This law that was passed also gives regulatory responsibility to the Department of Health over the health information exchange and around uses of data. So our approach, this slide shows our approach to building the statewide health information exchange, which is to create a longitudinal health record for individuals regardless of where the care was administered. It allows providers to view integrated data um, either through a web-based clinical viewer or by receiving a clinical summary that will be sent to them from the Health Information Exchange using the direct secure email message that's been created. Given that only consented data, though, can flow into current care, the Department of Health is going to need to work and is working directly with providers and hospitals to obtain their meaningful use data. And I do want to point out that the consent policies really vary from state to state, so that is not true in all states or for all uh, communities. Um, now I just want to give another example of how in Rhode Island we've used electronic health data for public health purposes. And during the H1N1 outbreak, the Department of Health worked closely with SureScripts and pharmacies to track the use of antivirals. One outcome was discovering that about 5% of the patients that were um, given antiviral prescriptions were delayed in filling it, and that allowed the health department to work with providers and really educate the population about the need to promptly fill prescription and take the antivirals right away. 
So as you've heard and will continue to hear, there are many challenges with this transformation that is underway. Many of them are well known and have already been discussed, such as staffing, funding, and changes in leaderships and in administration. And many of the technical and analytical challenges have also been discussed, just uh, for example, where the data is kept in the EHR, how to extract it and make it comparable. And again, one unique uh, challenge in Rhode Island is this issue around consent and the ability whether to be able to get the data from one place in the health information exchange to the Department of Health. Other states can do that. In our case, we're unable to do that. While challenges do exist, there are many opportunities for public health. EHRs and HIEs can provide and improve, can improve individual and population health, and they can really support data-driven decision-making used for analytics and for quality improvement. Their adoption promotes better integration and coordination, both technically and organizationally, and um, I think this is very important for health departments. And lastly, meaningful use of electronic health records and health information exchange have brought and continue to bring uh, attention and provide a better understanding of what public health informatics is. They also serve as tools to support and promote health care reform, which I think you'll hear more from on that topic from our uh, next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Farzad Madhujari. Thank you so much for inviting me. As a former EIS officer, it's always a pleasure to be back in CDC and to be addressing um, my former colleagues here at CDC and also uh, online. It's an incredible accomplishment, actually, the uh, dissemination of these uh, online. And it's, uh, it's an indication. I remember listening to those uh, cassette tapes of Epi Grand Rounds <laughs> as an EIS officer and, and how technology has fundamentally changed how we disseminate information um, is not limited to uh, Grand Rounds uh, presentations. A few years uh, ago, uh, Tom Frieden and I wrote a JAMA uh, perspective piece on uh, health care as if health mattered, a cheeky title. And we said, uh, look, in order to really improve uh, health care so that it produces health, we need to have some things happening simultaneously. We need health IT, but we also need payment reform. And what's amazing is that after so many decades, it's actually happening now. Health IT has been truly transformed through the passage of the HITECH Act, as we heard, and the health reform has truly transformed the incentives in the system to provide higher quality, more efficient, more coordinated care. And these two can work synergistically together. So we heard a lot about the phrase meaningful use and what I want to do today, if there's one thing you take away today, I want you to take away the importance of that concept and the significance of supporting that drive, that movement in everything that we do. So we start with the outcomes that we want, improved health for individuals and populations and the ability to have a learning healthcare system. That is meaningful use. The concept of it's not the technology, it's how you use it to get to the outcomes you want. And yes, those incentives, and payment adjustments to come for Medicaid and Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid, have been a main vector of driving interest and movement uh, after 20 years of it being really very slow, only among the earliest of adopters, like Dr. Lambert's. It is now becoming commonplace. 90% of hospital CIOs say it's their top two priorities for the next few years. And we know that this is going to require adoption. It's going to require exchange. We've set in place grant programs that are and contracts with our $2 billion to help make that happen and a framework of privacy and security. But let's drill down into what meaningful use is. We heard about the public health measures, right? This is what people focus on when they say meaningful use in public health. Syndromic surveillance, immunization registries, and electronic lab reporting. And that's well and good and important and we've already seen, we've already hearing from maybe some of your listeners uh, in state and local health departments about this incredible surge in interest all of a sudden from hospitals and providers saying, I want to hook up to you. And we hear about the challenges of meeting that demand. But it's not just about electronic reporting. Meaningful use is also about having fewer people die prematurely from our leading killer, leading preventable killer, cardiovascular disease. I mean, one point here is 
Healthcare is actually good enough now that the fact that only half the time do people get the basic stuff, the aspirin, blood pressure, cholesterol, and smoking, the clinical preventive services only about half the time, that actually matters. That actually means we're leaving lots and lots of lives on the table through healthcare. So what do we do to fix that? Well, you can't fix what you can't see. If we can't see the quality of care we're delivering, and right now, you know, how do we do it? I don't know. Every couple of years, we'll do an in Haines. But a, but a practice doesn't know that. A practice can't go by their row of shelves and say, i got some time on my hands today. Uh, today, I'm going to go chart by chart and jot down whether this patient has hypertension as well controlled. So quality measurement is first. And we have to make quality measurement done by providers, not done to providers. The second is decision support and registry functions. So decision support is not alerts for everything that you're doing all day long. It's to tell people, remind them what's important. You have a patient in front of you with 15 issues you could talk to them about. What's the one or two most important things you shouldn't forget to do? Registry functions are even more revolutionary. Registry functions say healthcare providers don't want to deliver healthcare the way retail salespeople sell shoes. Healthcare providers don't want to be in the business of waiting until someone comes in and then saying, how can I help you? Right? That's selling shoes. What we really want to do is know who the denominator is. Right? The greatest invention, in my belief, the denominator. Who's the cohort? Who's the full list of people who have diabetes? How many of them had their blood sugar poorly controlled and are not on insulin and have not been seen in the past month and are not due for a visit to come? You can't do that with paper. You can do it with registry functions. But you can't do quality measurement decision support or registry functions unless the information can be operated on by the computer. It's structured. It's there. You have the vitals. You have the demographics. You have the blood pressure. You have the problem list. You have the med list. You need that basic stuff in there. And that's what meaningful use is. Right now, we're halfway to meaningful use. If a doctor does these things, they're halfway to being a meaningful user. So what else is in meaningful? Oh, sorry. This is just, I'll just skip this. <laughs> All right, fine. This shows. <laughs> This shows how implementing an electronic health, this is a clinic we worked with in New York City, implemented a, a EHR, gold-plated EHR in 2003, one of those early adopters and Davies Award winners. Nine months with the system, they were delivering on a 20 doses of Pneumovax a month. They implemented a simple decision support, and they ran out of vaccine the next month. And then, this is a natural experiment, um, the, someone shut off the alert by mistake, and they went whoop, right back where they were before. Um, anyway. So decision support does work. Um, but decision support can also work not only for improving care proactively, it can also help us harm fewer people because healthcare does, not because anyone wants to, but because of our systems. We do harm people. We harm too many people. And there's some simple things that we know these systems can help us with. If you or enter the order into the system, at least it's going to be legible. It gives you an opportunity for drug, drug, and drug allergy interactions. If you send that prescription electronically, if you can reconcile medications between sites of care from home to hospital, hospital to post-acute care, these things work, and they're part of meaningful use. But most of health is not what happens in the doctor's office. This is the same person, actually. Most of our health is determined by our own behaviors, yours and mine. But we have to help, the healthcare system has to help empower people, at least not stand in the way. So what does that mean? Well, one is giving people reminders. We get reminders from our vets, from our dentist, from our mechanic. Now, it's great if you have a cat. But what about for our healthcare? More and more people will be getting reminders, like Dr. Lamberts is doing, because of meaningful use. It also means people having information when they need it, when they're, they can share it with who they want to share it with, they can understand it. Because most of us forget most of what we heard in the doctor's office within seconds of leaving it. Fact. So it means having a simple after-visit summary. Print that out. Low-tech. It's part of meaningful use. It also means giving people copies of their own information. 
making it okay to ask for your own information. It's okay to ask your doctor, to ask the hospital, to ask the emergency room for your records. It's even, you know, the law. <laughs> but we need to make this more normal. We need to make it easier, not just legal, but easier for people to get their own records. Because all too often, when it comes to care coordination, it's the patient who shows up at the specialist, who shows up in the emergency room, who shows up back with the primary care doctor after their discharge, and the doctor says, I don't have the information. I didn't get the papers. Can you explain to me what happened to you during your hospitalization? That's not fair to do that without giving people the means of doing that. But yes, we also need to work with things like information exchanges to help business to business, provider to provider, provider to hospital, exchanges of information among all that network, sharing those care summaries. So that's it. I mean, that's what meaningful use is. I'm not hiding anything. That's it. Meaningful use really is the most distilled explanation that we could come up with of what is the pathway, the, the roadmap to delivering care that is higher quality, safer, more efficient, more coordinated, patient-centered, and secure. It really is. That's all it is. And thanks to the movements that's coming on the payment side, it's also going to be how people are going to be able to thrive in business so they don't go broke delivering higher quality, more coordinated care. So there's lots of public health opportunities, right? Addressing disparities. You can just think, all of you can be thinking to yourself now, whoa, what could we do with all this data and the linkage with clinical care and the bilaterality of it, right? Improving chronic disease care, not just for cardiovascular, but for asthma, diabetes, and so forth. Improving public health surveillance for a whole host of things. Reporting of births and deaths. Reducing prescription drug overdose deaths. All of these are possible, but there are realities. Budgets, siloed funding, bandwidth, IT, staffing, workforce, state requirements, things we have to do. And every time you get more data in, it's just, it just started, the, right? The work just starts the day you start getting the new information flows in. It's incorporating those into workflows that takes so much work and time and effort, proving out their value. And many of us and many of our Partners in state and local health departments are overwhelmed and just wary. We're just tired with all the things that are happening and all the things we have to do. And it can be frustrating dealing with those people, right? If only they would just stop being so narrow in their parochial interests, right? And understand that, you know, what they have to do for public health. Well, here are the clinical realities. <laughs> they got all the same things. They're running faster just to stay in place. They have all the same issues, and they're frustrated with us public health people saying to them, <laughs> and they look at us and say, you guys just think about your thing, right? Your narrow lens. So what's the way forward here? This reminds me of a quote by William Gibson. It says, uh, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So I think everywhere, everyone who can start doing the crazy, exciting, fun, who has the energy, who has the capability, who has the partnerships for doing these things, do it. Go. Do the trials. Prove it. Show the evidence. Like the idea of the public health advice. These are the, what the, not just the centers of excellence in public health informatics, although they play an important role. We want there to be a nation of healthcare providers working with their public health departments and academic groups to create these we also have states, whole states, where they're ready to move on something, whether it's outpatient syndromic or prescription monitoring programs. Go, do it, show it. And then we have a few things that we can maybe, maybe do nationwide, which is what meaningful use and the certification for EHRs are. But let's not confuse these levels. Let's not have every bright idea we have, the solution to that is put it in meaningful use. Every state thing that works, Let's make it part of meaningful use. Let's pick a few things and just knock the hell out of them. Maybe electronic lab reporting is that.
So here's what I ask from you. We've got to make this meaningful use thing work. We've got to make it work. Stage one, meaningful use, ELR immunization syndromic. We've got to make that work. In the states, in the CDC. We've got to be ready to participate. If the healthcare providers are doing the work, we've got to hold up our end of the bargain. We've got to help them however we can make this succeed for our sake. Two, we can't go it alone. We've got to coordinate. What Medicaid's doing is really important. What the state health IT coordinator is doing is really important. What the health information exchange is doing. God, if you have a beacon community, if you have one of those 17 states that have a beacon community, if you have a grantee in those beacon communities working on community transformation grants or wellness communities, if we're not working, coordinating across those programs, shame on us. We have got to coordinate our activities better. I would say ask for data sparingly because every piece of every bit of data that we're asking for is a huge amount of work and burden and workflow changes on the other part. But let's give data generously. Let's be open with our data. Let's not do public health exceptionalism and standards. Let's not do that. Because the work involved from the perspective of the providers and vendors, if we have national standards, let's have national standards. Let's not have a whole different set of vocabulary, terminology, messaging, transport standards when it comes to public health, and then one for the whole the rest of healthcare. That just doesn't make sense. Let's cherish the innovation, but also cherish the skeptics. And we have both of those in the crowd, I suspect, some of them in the same person. We need both. We need the people who keep the fire alive, and we need the people who keep it grounded, eye on the prize and feet on the ground. And I think, finally, from us, from Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, hold us accountable. If we're not doing our job coordinating, hold us accountable, and let's go get it. Thank you. We do have uh, time for some questions. Uh, please use a microphone as we're recording. If you're on Envision, notify your coordinator if you want to ask a question. And if you can't find us any other way, ask at meaningfuluse at cdc.gov, and you'll receive an email response at some point in the future from CDC staff. Uh, hi. Um, can you hear? I'm, I'm Miguel Torres. I'm here from Axe Fellow at the Influence Division. Um, I think I'm a believable also and, a, and skeptic. And my question is, um, isn't too ambitious the goals we had set for public health? I mean, I, I believe meaningful use is going to happen, and it's happening already, yet it may be too ambitious for us. And this, this comes from two reasons. One, usually you need in the field somebody who has formal training, not only clinical training, but also formal training in informatics, and it's very rare to find those. Somebody who has both training both. And once you find them, those kind of people are very expensive to maintain. They, they cost a lot, a lot of money to train and also to, to keep them in one place. So maybe because of this, we, we have to reassess our strategy and make sure that the goals that we're setting are meaningful. I mean, we, we have, you know, we said, oh, electronic health records are here and things are going to change okay. and every, every so time. So we're going to we're gonna ask the question. Uh, I'm going to so. start with Farzad and uh, see if others have comment. So uh, the question is, should we, um, you know, is meaningful use too ambitious? And, or for public health departments, can we really participate in particularly the workforce issue? We gotta be smarter. We, this is, I mean, the reality is we can't, we, we're not gonna have more and more funding for, for this. We have to find ways of doing, you know, the, the famous phrase, doing more with less. A lot of that means not reduplicating silos within health departments where we have the same staff, you know, the duplicate requirements around maintaining silos for TB systems and STD systems and communicable systems and childhood screening systems and on and on and on and on and on. We are spending a lot on IT and informatics in health departments. We do need to be smarter about it. We need to find ways that are permissible under your, you know, the COTARs here in the, in the crowd or 
the grant project officers to give flexibility to the states to be able to develop some core informatics capacity and to extend those resources. Yeah, and I would concur that for this to be practical, we still have very much work to do to constrain uh, messaging, vocabulary, many of the other things that Farzad talked about. So we may need to focus on the initial lanes that have been set in the early stages of meaningful use and be very cautious about going too far beyond them until we do the work that is in front of us. Over to the other side. Um, John Iskander, CDC Science Office. Uh, thanks for a very interesting presentation. So there are uh, what we might call some legacy systems in this field. Um, thinking of some collaborations that go back two decades, the Kaisers and the Vaccine Safety Data Link, um, other models internationally as well. And they are going to be very important when we have HIE and EHR that can actually generate research and, and surveillance and, and answer public health questions. Are we sure that we have those linkages in place so that we can learn the lessons that you know, they've already learned about the you know, benefits and pitfalls of these systems? I think we can say we're not sure, but considerable work is happening. For example, ONC has pulled together federal agencies across H, uh, 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 units of HHS to work on how do we take existing things like some of those that you've mentioned and turn them into a learning health system. But there's work to be done. Jack, did you have a? No, I'm sorry. I think from a you know from a state health department, it's just as important as from the federal perspective. So we need to train ourselves and in, in health departments at the state level begin to look at things in a more enterprise way. So the legacy siloed systems you know are a challenge, and it takes sort of pushing people to get out of their box and to think about how to, from a more organizational pers uh, you know perspective, be able to have the systems connect and both organizationally think about how to organize staff and individuals that way, as well as technically. It's not easy, and it takes time, which is sort of um, the challenge side, but there are huge opportunities to really think about how to do this differently, and I think we have to be very open-minded and you know, push others in our departments of health to, to be able to do that. And I apologize, we only have time for one more question, and hopefully it'll be a yes-no question. Just kidding about that. No chance. Uh, hi, Stuart Berman, I'm with uh, HIV, STD, TB, viral hepatitis center, which we have plenty of silos, and we have plenty of standalone systems, and we have uh, programs embedded in health departments that have all of their problems, and more and more, the, the use of HIT is going to be critical, not necessarily for case reporting, but for monitoring delivery of care, particularly to marginalized populations, which won't necessarily be a provider specific kind of report across communities. These approaches are critical to the future. Now the question is, how do you move from where we are to where you need to be? It's hard to do it within the programs. You're probably going to need a couple of outstanding examples and show what it takes at the state level. Can't do it within the program. There's not the capacity. How do we find the outstanding examples? How do we actually find the right partner to, to make progress in that? Well, I think you gave a great answer. And, and uh, my, my, my answer is at the Public Health Informatics Conference in August in Atlanta, <laughs> you will find the great examples that should be emulated nationwide. And with that, uh, let me uh, bring up Tanya. Um, thank you all so much. This was a wonderful audience. Apologies for a little bit shorter discussion, but you have to admit that presentations today were really extraordinary, so I hope that will make up for a little bit less time. Uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you very much. One more round for our speakers.